If you look at the history, Jews lived in India for 2,000 years. About 900 uh, Indian soldiers are buried in the soil of Israel. Mm -hmm. They fought before Israel was there uh, with the Brits, against the Turks. So there are many links. There were a few visits, high-level visits of uh, Israeli presidents, Israeli Prime Minister Sharon, uh, the Indian president to Israel. But the game changer was probably the visit of Prime Minister Modi to Israel in 2017. I've served as ambassador in quite a few countries and, and a diplomat in more others. I think India by far has the most popular support towards Israel. Our cooperation, India and Israel cooperation, counterterrorism, as I said before, is very wide, very developed, from intelligence gathering to special forces to reaction forces. Fauda <coughs> is very popular here. I hear it every place, everywhere. Everyone speaks to me about it. They're coming out with the Indian version of... Uh, Namaste Jai Hind, welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Today I spoke with uh, Israel's ambassador to India, Naur Gilon. Uh, it was about India-Israel relations. Everybody knows that it's on a very sound footing, from top down onwards, people to people contact. Uh, on everything, it is a relationship which is more of a partnership now, uh, considering that uh, there was a time that even on our passports, it said, you know, not valid for Israel. We didn't even recognize Israel formally. We didn't have diplomatic relations with Israel. From that era, which was in the you know, Cold War era. From that, we have really come forward to partnership at so many levels. But this interview was more about just India-Israel relations. He spoke about his uh, his growing up in a family where there was a Holocaust survivor in his grandparent and uh, the reality of Israel today where uh, it, it speaks to other countries from a position of strength yet its foreign policy is more flexible than it has ever been. It's talking to countries which even don't formally acknowledge the existence of Israel. So there's a lot that it has in common with India when it comes to uh, a neighborhood which is volatile, which uh, which is hostile even uh, in, in not accepting Israel's existence. India is fighting a two and a half front war. Where are our similarities and where are our differences? Watch or listen to this very interesting conversation. Mr. Gilon, thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you, you know, uh, recently the Indian foreign minister, he said that when he was asked about why India-Israel relations aren't as robust and not as thriving as they used to be or they could have, not used to be, as they could have been, what were the impediments? Uh, he said that uh, we could have benefited from the ties, but... Uh, once you come back out of vote bank politics, your foreign policies also get impacted. Gone are the days when vote bank politics dominated national interest. Uh, I think what uh, what he was saying was that, you know, that at some point of time, India-Israel relations could have been more than uh, they were. And now we are on this uh, on this trajectory, upward trajectory. How was this uh, comment viewed in Israel? I think it's uh, probably reflecting the the situation as it was. So if going back to our relations, Israel was established a few months after uh, India, and uh, David Ben Gurion, our first prime minister, is so India or the Indian Indian movement as a sister movement, as a role model. He himself was practicing yoga and was is very close. If you go to his house in in Zdeboke, in the, in the Negev Desert, where he lived his last years, you see the picture of Gandhi on, on his bedroom wall. So for him, by the way, after the, the first countries to recognize Israel then were uh, the Soviet Union of the USSR and the US. And he said, once India will support us, we close the full cycle. And it took another couple of years, only 1950, and then in '53, we put a consulate in Mumbai, a not re non reciprocal. So India did not do the same. And of course, consulate in Mumbai is important. Bombay of the time is important, but um, it doesn't do all the functions. So we we did have relations over the years. We were cooperating, especially in defense, uh, very significantly, even without full uh, diplomatic full diplomatic relations, sense of embassies and everything. Then in '92. 
India, together with a big wave in the world after collapse of Soviet Union, Cold the, War and, ending. The Cold War yes. ending and the Madrid conference, uh, peace mm. conference in 1991. So there was a, a slight, uh, I think, change of countries towards Israel. India joined the race. And there were, there were a few visits, high-level visits of uh, Israeli presidents, Israeli Prime Minister Sharon, uh, the Indian president to Israel. But the game changer was probably the visit of Prime Minister Modi to Israel in 2017. And then a few months later, in January 18th, Netanyahu coming here. Because I think, you know, This was the dehyphenation uh, mm. basis of saying there is the Palestinian issue, but this cannot be the thing that is representing our relations with Israel. It has to be treated separately from Israel. And uh, he defined also the relations strategic partnership at that visit. We defined together. And, uh, you know, I've served as ambassador in quite a few countries and, and a diplomat in more others. And... I think India by far has the most popular support towards Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, if you speak to people in India, my experience, I visited already now, I did a head count after f concluding now a year, I visited about 11, 12 different uh, states, uh, states India, here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to go around because I understand that Delhi is Delhi, it's not India. Um, and every place I go, I hear a lot of admiration towards Israel. Really, it's very, you know, for different people, from high level and for low level, from all, all, all kinds of people. And what uh, Prime Minister Modi did, together with Netanyahu at the time, they really made it now a top, a top down. It came right. from the political level. The same message that came from the... Uh, they met in the middle both messages of the people wanting to have more relations with Israel. It was also this uh, shying away from the actuality, shying away from the fact that we needed each other. Or rather, India, um, uh, you know, now yeah. India is saying that it's one of the trusted and valued partners, not just not just a relationship, but like a partnership. Yeah. I think it took time to reach uh, this stage, right? Yes, I, I took time and the big shift, as I said, 2017, Because the pictures of the two prime ministers together on the sea in uh, Israel... Those were uh, very iconic pictures. <laughs> iconic pictures sent a message to people. You know, if you look at uh, history, Jews lived in India as equal citizens and no different than any other minority. There are so many minorities and different religions in this country. So Jews lived here for 2,000 years. And also later on came new waves of Jews from, uh, we call them Baghdadi, but they came from the Middle East in general, yes. not only from Iraq. And they were very, also very successful in business. You look at uh, in, in Mumbai, uh, the Sassoon family, for example. There are a few very strong families. And, Baghdadi Jews, and, yes. Uh, Baghdadi Jews and also in Bollywood, uh, yes. the first actresses were Jewish Baghdadi women. And they were very strong here. So you would think that naturally it will continue. 900, about 900 uh, Indian soldiers are buried in the soil of Israel. Mm -hmm. They fought before Israel was there uh, with the Brits, against the Turks. So there are many links that should have made us. And I, I understand what uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar is speaking about. Of course, the, uh, one of the considerations of, uh, of India was to get support on the Pakistani issue, hoping that if they take a side, they will be supported. I think that also this was, mm -hmm. there was a disillusion on that. And also the need of India as a very strong country today It's not the same country that it was when it was established. I think yes. it's a self-assured, strong country and can have its own independent foreign policy without being afraid of what others would say. But uh, now that you mentioned Pakistan, I have to get on to that. Uh, Pakistan is one of the countries which doesn't recognize Israel even now in 2022. But there are reports that a Pakistani and an Indonesian de delegation was in Israel recently. Do we see a, you know, a recognition of the reality and Pakistan opening uh, diplomatic ties with Israel in the near future? I must say that our policy from day one was speaking to whoever is ready to speak to us. We never said no to anyone. Our problem is that many, especially Muslim countries, not only, but especially, mm -hmm. refuse to speak to us. They refuse to have any connections, any, and Pakistan is one of these countries. So every time they are like track uh, two, track three, you know, people, some of them not living in, living in, in, the, in their own countries anymore, are ready to come and speak As people to people, we are very happy to speak to people. I think that dialogue is very important. I don't think that uh, in the near future we would have uh, full diplomatic relations or uh, diplomatic relations with Pakistan. And by the way, not because of us necessarily, but because of Pakistan. They are yes. refusing. 
and yeah. also I think Pakistan is also uneasy with mm. India and Israel cooperating on defense because uh, their entire thing is that you know it's being used in Kashmir and if they were to recognize open dip- diplomatic ties with Israel then they cannot do that because ideologically they are aligned with with the whole issue of Kashmir does that make uh, sense no I, I and for me as a diplomat I know that diplomacy is used to influence if you want to influence Israel, today what is their influence of countries who have no really diplomatic relations with Israel be it uh, Pakistan be it other countries so if you want to influence a country you have to have relations because at the end of the day it's like people you have to have a relationship in order to listen to the other side or you know you have to have something the other side wants from you and when there are no relations there is nothing their influence over israel or the ability to say to israel please do this don't do that is not existent just not existent yes and in fact uh, you know last year uh, they even said that india state sponsored continuing widespread surveillance and spying operations is in clear breach of global norms of responsible state behavior and this was in reaction to uh, some media reports to say that india was using spy technology which was which they got from israel to spy on uh, then a uh, prime minister uh, imran khan so that that rankles them that we are uh, india and israel are cooperating on uh, cyber security and they feel that 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 technology is being used against pakistan i can tell you that we are cooperating of everything really mm-hmm. there are very few i don't know of any barricades to our cooperation it's very intimate it's in all fields it's in intelligence in counter terrorism in 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 everything in every field So this is part of our intimacy and our excellent relations. Uh you know a- another element that I'm I'm very proud to mention is the fact that uh, Adani won the Haifa port. Israel has only two Mediterranean port ports and we are in a sense an island because our neighborhood is not a friendly neighborhood. So our exit to the Mediterranean is crucial for us. So we have two ports. One of them is now in the hands of Adani. It's a strategic asset for Israel. very highly strategic and the fact that it's put in indian hands he's paying money it's not in that but you are ready to deposit a strategic asset in indian hands hands for me it's a wonderful wonderful signal right but uh, you do uh, get it that you're talking about uh, you know you, uh, it's something that we have in common i guess india and uh, and israel that we have we are in a neighborhood which is hostile uh, and you are also aware that you know india is defense experts have said this that india is fighting a two and a half front war so pakistan and china encircling india we have these two neighbors uh, and they are hostile and they are uncomfortable with india doing this like what you're talking about it doesn't bother them that if we share water technology we share uh, technology on drip irrigation or on food security and stuff like that but if as soon as it comes to anti terror operations military and espionage related issues it bothers these two countries does it at all uh, come up in conversations in the security establishment in israel No, I think that the decision was uh, taken uh, to do full full cooperation with India as we have with very few countries in the world I believe. Uh, again, we don't see it against anyone. When we work together on counter terrorism or collecting uh, information, it's mainly for prevention of uh, hostility towards us, you and us, mm-hmm. Israel. We are not doing it against an- anyone. We are doing it in order to defend ourselves. So anyone who is seeing that as hostility the problem is with him not with us right. we have to be i think that if there is a lesson learned from ukraine the whole ukraine crisis is that uh, when you're in trouble you better be self sufficient and ready to fight for your own independence otherwise no one will fight for you so you know the lesson is be prepared be ready be tough project power in the sense that if you project power the sense the, the chance that you will be attacked will be lower you know if you are perceived as weak the chances are higher this is in the middle east at least for us the projection of power is very very important and to send the message that of the terrence of telling others don't mess with us it will be costly for you 
this so you're this talking about a tough stance but i i am seeing a more flexible israel today uh, <coughs> you know i mean your abraham accords like i think two years since yes. uh, that and uh, your outreach to the middle east to the gulf nations it's something that uh, it's not contrary but i there's a flexibility to your foreign policy that it's, one is it's complementary i would say yeah. I, on the one hand our enemies have to know that we are standing strong and tall uh we will not tolerate we will preempt we will take whatever action is needed to protect our people and to prevent them from building capabilities to harm us in the future on the other hand as i said in in the beginning we are always with open arms to anyone who wants to come in peace and have negotiations with us and i must say that the gulf countries have been having different kind of relations with israel over the years but they were quite relations when they needed the defense assistance cooperation technologies capacities and they also came to Israel but they did it quietly i believe that in all the middle east one of the reasons that countries are more open to coming or publicly coming getting close to israel is the fear of iran this right. is a element that is uniting because uh, you know you look at iran and i know that india and israel see things differently I, i'm not sure that india's interpretation of iran's behavior is different than israel the interests are different and the behavior of iran or the joint interest towards afghanistan or having ports together or trade or uh, energy are are different but when you look at the middle east most of us in the middle east in the uh, as you call it uh, 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 west asia we see iran as a destabilizing force we see them involved in iraq in syria in lebanon with Hezbo- through hezbollah mm. uh, with the palestinian organizations in yemen with the houthis in bahrain they tried and through the houthis they are destabil or trying to destabilize both saudi arabia and uae by shooting at them so when you look at our region you see iran as a big destabilizer and israel is perceived as probably as the country which is the most proactive to prevent iran from it, this kind of action and i think that this is one of the reasons that these countries want to be close to israel there is a feeling i think in the sense in the world that we are living in a little bit of a mess there is no boss in the world there is no one mm. or two powers that are running the world anymore it's a more messy world i think isis the whole affair and everything was all, also the american withdrawal from the middle east the uh, russians with ukraine so everyone is busy with its own thing and i think the the realization that these geographical ba- boundaries or even ideological um boundaries are very fluid when it comes to terrorism it can affect anybody so just because you're a muslim country doesn't mean that terrorism is not going to come your way it can come i think then uh, uh there's there's this awakening that they have to collaborate with other countries to okay. protect their own yes. uh you were mentioning iran how do you see this new uh, street protests which are happening with regard to hijab i've seen very guarded uh, statements coming from israel saying that they support uh the the street movements but it's it's still uh, do you think at a nascent stage early stages uh, you know it's very hard to predict uh, revolutions mm. we know that the iranian regime is very strong we know that there is a lot of opposition to the religious direction that it's taking the state and the religious laws hijab uh, wearing w- being one of them that they don't like it and and others we know all of that but still we cannot predict when there will be a flipping moment where uh, there will be a revolution for the time being it seems that uh, the regime is very very strong mm-hmm. it controls also a lot of the economy and this is one of our fears from the iran deal the jcpoa is that beyond the fact that we feel that it will not give enough assurances on nuclear and other elements of destabilization support of terrorism missiles and many others it will big give a huge influx of money to iran so they will get 2 to 300 billion dollars immediately release of uh, frozen assets etc and this and they will start selling oil in huge uh, quantities and this for us if we would think that this money would go to help the population we would be the happiest people but we believe that it will go help spread the the gospel this uh, unfortunate mm. gospel of shiite uh, rule or dominance in the middle east and this is our fear you know i i must remind everyone that during the days of the shah 
Israel, we had diplomatic relations, we had ambassadors, we had very good relations, we had joint, uh, we built uh, pipelines. It was like a different country, so, a different if country. I may say. It was yeah. a different country and a yeah. different reality for us. True, true. Uh, what about Turkey? I mean, you've, uh, on the sidelines of the UNGA, now suddenly, uh, you know, your heads of government have met Turkey and uh, your head. So, uh, do you see a change, a shift even in Turkey happening? They made a statement on Kashmir, of course, they do that every UNGA, but it's a... It's a little bit of a muted statement and I believe Pakistan's not too happy uh, that, you know, Erdogan didn't flash cards with Kashmir atrocities, if I may put in quotes, happening. So how is it, how do you see, do you see Turkey trying to recalibrate now its relationship with your country? I think that uh, Turkey, during the time of Erdogan, before Erdogan, we used to have very close relations, very stable relations, the defense forces on both sides were a strong element of these relations. Since Erdogan has come, our relations knew ups and downs all the time. And now I'm very happy that we have an up rather than a down. Mm. Bottom line is, if you look at the Middle East, there are three non-Arab states in the Middle East. These are Israel, Turkey, and Iran. Mm. And both uh, Turkey and Iran, of course, are Muslim. Uh, Israel is Jewish, but three of us are non-Arab Potentially, we should have been very close yes. allies in the sense of uh, being together and being different in the region, but we are not because of political reasons. Erdogan, I think, uh, has quite a... He himself has quite a complicated situation. The economic situation of Turkey is not the, the brightest, and uh, I, I think he is trying to recalibrate, but not only with Israel. In general, he's all the time trying to shift and see. He's very flexible in foreign policy in the sense of looking for opportunities and... and uh, situations uh, he can he can turkey can make a lot of money out of connection with israel also on gas there is a lot of gas in the middle east but they also have to settle with greece and cyprus because they have their own issues with them so on, on energy gas. will probably <clears throat> be the peacemaker between I, I don't know you, you know that even at the worst of times most of our oil comes from azerbaijan from the baku jihan fr through turkey to mm. the mediterranean there is a pipeline mm. so even at worst of times, it never stops. That worked, By the yeah. way, even at the worst of times, uh, Turkish airlines, who are making a lot of flights to Israel, they, they do connections, freight, they do everything. Mm. They continued. So the practical side is going on. The econo economy is going on. The problem was always the political, which the ups and downs, mainly in the political and the defense that we... In the, in the past, we used to be very intimate uh, on defense cooperation. And today, unfortunately, um, we are not at the same status mm. it's not like india or anything mm. of, of the kind so you know it, it's a pragmatic foreign policy of trying yeah. to use opportunities i think and of everyone the thing is that you know india the reason india would be so interested is because we've got millions of expat indians working in the middle east in all yeah. these west asian countries so uh, if if israel improves its relationship and plays a larger role in uh, West Asia, whether it be in civilian matters or whether it be in political matters, it you know everything improves. The connectivity improves. More Indian students can you know travel, work. So all this uh, helps India. So I, don't you think that um, it it's something that benefits both countries beyond than just the West Asian realm? Yes, I I will take it with your permission a little bit back. I spoke of sure. the the nation, this policy of. Uh, Prime Minister Modi of saying, uh, you know, the Palestinian issue is the Palestinian issue, Israel is Israel, we deal with both of them in parallel, we don't, not mm. one account on the other. I think this is the basis that uh, later on is in the thinking also of UAE, Bahrain, and then Morocco joining the Abraham Accords, mm. uh, that they said, look, the Palestinian issue is there, we invested in the Palestinians a lot of capital, both money and political capital and every investment and everything, and nothing is moving. There is also a problem of the, I think, of the Palestinian leadership and the feeling that there is no state building. So a lot is poured in, but it's not taken into, it's taken into daily consumption rather than state building. Uh, so this was the foundation, I think, this, this, this thought of the Abraham Accords, and the Abraham Accords are the foundations for the I2U2. And I think this is very important to say. Because I2U2, which is Israel, uh, India, Israel, US, and UAE, UAE, the four of us, which are, will work together as a group of four to do infrastructure projects, we already announced. They were the establishing of the first meeting was when uh, 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 External Affairs Minister Jason Kao visited Israel last October. I was with him then in the visit. 
and there was a, a foreign minister meeting. And now uh, when Biden, uh, President Biden visited Israel, they did an online with Prime Minister Modi also joining mm. of the le leaders uh, summit. And they agreed and they announced two projects uh, in India, both to be implemented in India. One uh, food farm, very advanced Israeli technology, UAE led. Uh, and the second one, uh, energy farms, uh, clean energy farms, wind and solar led by Americans. Also, we will uh, join with technology and everything. And uh, India, I think, it's the triangle that you can see in the Middle East is UAE, I think, in mm. also in size, in magnitude of economy. Size, of course, India is vast in size. But the economy and the fact that there are so many influential Indians working in the Gulf, and especially in UAE, mm. in the economy of UAE, it's a bridge. And we will be able to work. We are working together already. The so three I2U2 of us. is essentially going to be economic partnership. Uh, it doesn't have an, uh, a security element to it, or no, is there no, not no yet? security element? No, not not yet. I don't think that it, it should have a security element because if we start speaking of security, each one has its own concern. As I said, for mm. example, India and Israel don't agree on Iran, and I guess that also the Americans don't agree with mm. India on Iran. Okay. And so, if we, so you're keeping that out so of if the we, realm. So if we will put in Iran, you will put in uh, Pakistan. Your, co your concerns, <laughs> sure. and each one will put in, it will be blocked. Okay. And our idea is to be very pragmatic, very economic, not against anyone, but for, for our people, for our countries, at the end of the day, and for humanity, because we, if we do green technology, we are not only helping humanity, but I believe that there will be also technology which will be relevant for humanity coming out of this cooperation because the capabilities, putting together the capabilities of our four countries, yeah. both human resources and, and, and money, can bring, I think, the world a good message. I am going to come on green technology and agriculture, Ambassador. But before I do that, of course, uh, it will be remiss if it, if I don't speak about the whole Pegasus issue. Uh, India, what is Pegasus? E exactly. I thought as much that <laughs> you're going to say that I don't know anything. This is exactly the reaction we get from Indian government, uh, uh, you know, anybody we speak in the government. So both you and India says we don't know anything about it, but media reports suggest that India did buy spy technology and uh, so did other countries buy technology uh, from Israel and uh, the end users in some countries it's used to spy on uh, on the opposition on media uh, on people against the establishment so even if you don't want to talk about Pegasus, if you can just tell us, how do you see whether end use is done or not? NSO also no, says I, we did. I, I want to speak. I, I was joking that I was saying okay. what Pegasus. No, I, I want to speak about Pegasus. I think it's important. Uh, NSO, the company, which is not the only one in the world that has softwares of this kind, right. uh, developed this software in order to uh, combat terrorism and organized crime. That is the aim in general. Uh, it's a private company. It's not owned by Israel, but we uh, applied on them export controls like in weapons. So we see the potential in this mm. system. So they have to apply through us. And we, as a government, we limit their ability to export, first of all, only to governments mm. and also only to certain governments that we deem as responsible enough for using it. Uh, this is more or less the situation, whether uh, people are taking this and using it in other ways, I'm not aware of it. I'm really not aware of it. But the idea for us, mm. it you know, we need to be a step ahead of the terrorists at the end of the day. They have the abilities to, to eavesdrop on us in different ways and penetrate and cyber wars on us and everything. We have to be a step ahead of them. We have to be able to foil their attempts to attack and disrupt our lives. And I think this is very crucial. It should be used as it should be used, but it's an important system. And again, it's a private company, not Israel, a private Israeli company, but we put the maximum export control we can on this uh, system. When you talk about terror networks, you know, uh, if I can take you back, it was in the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks that most people in India woke up to the fact that uh, India has been a laggard. India has held back on taking uh, stringent and proactive measures to crush terror networks. We have been more, India had been more reactive to, uh, you know, to uh, anti-terror operations till then. It's then that India woke up and many at that stage said, why don't we cooperate with Mossad? Uh, and 
I, as you would be aware, wherever you go, I'm sure you get asked about uh, your uh, spy network and your anti-terror operations and how uh, it's it's legendary in India, if I may say. And there are many who are afraid of it, who are scared of the Mossad and say that, oh, that's not what we need in our country. But there are others who hero worship, you know, people who read spy novels, who watch Netflix serials. Uh, what do you have to say about how India has dealt with terror since 2008? I, I don't want to say about India, but I can say that our cooperation, India and Israel cooperation, counterterrorism, as I said before, is very wide, very developed. Uh, from intelligence gathering to special forces to reaction forces to everything, we are working quite in, in, intimately together. And I believe that uh, what happened then probably... Uh, will be more complicated to execute today in the same manner. Uh, that attack will hopefully, uh, next time, God forbid, things like that happen, uh, the ability of, Turk, of, of India to, to foil or to will, will be better. I hope so. I believe so, and I hope mm. so. You think systems in, uh, I mean, your reading or Israel's reading of how India has learned from 2008 that systems are better in place now in India? Yes, Is I'm that sure. how uh, you view it? Yes, I believe I believe that there are, it's much more advanced, the systems, the abilities, the capabilities, the response abilities, the, the reaction forces. I think that every, everyone learns from the past. The problem we have as Israel, we always complain about ourselves that we are always prepared for the previous war. And the next war is always different. So you, one, <clears throat> I mean, you live in a state of constant conflict, yes. if I may say. Yes. I mean, I empathize with you. And when I went to Israel, I saw for myself. Uh, I'm one of that generation who in our passports had that stamp which said not valid for Israel. It's, it's you know, uh, it, it, my first you passport had it. Okay. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I had that on my passport. And when I got the visa, uh, I remember very hesitatingly, uh, uh, the visa officer said that if you want, you can take a paper visa. Don't yes. get it stamped yes. because you may not be able to travel to the countries that you have traveled to uh, if you have it stamped on your passport. And I've, I found that such a difficult existence to be apologetic of stamping you know most countries are arrogant about stamping uh, on the on the on the passport and uh, she said this to me and i said well if if a country will not give me a visa because i have your country's visa then i will not visit that country i'm fine with it yes. so we were a delegation which went and some people uh, took a uh, a paper pa a paper visa and when we, we were done with that when we had visited your country we saw everything they said we made a mistake those two people or two or three who were there said we should have also stamped our passports we are proud uh, you know uh, we understand what the sentiment so uh, while I got where you know you uh, came from and it was a it was a very moving movement uh, moment at that time but uh, sir, I also uh, realize that it, it is such a difficult period uh, that you've gone through. You've lived that through that period too. Does it, does it move you to what you are today where you get accepted so willingly everywhere in the yeah, world? Yeah, I think it starts earlier. It start, my, my father was born in Germany. My mother was born in England. Uh, my father is a Holocaust survivor. So my grandfather didn't survive. Many of the family didn't survive. Uh, and my father came to Israel in 1949, just after the establishment of Israel. He was 14 years old. He fought until 1982, all the wars of Israel. And we grew up in a house, we are three brothers. We grew up in a, in a very Zionist house. So my father came from a very orthodox background, but he left the orthodox background. And uh, he became a Zionist. He traded one thing for another, I think. And... Uh, I grew up in this reality. I mean, it was clear to me that the duty is to go and serve in the military. It's, it's compulsory. It's a conscription yes. in Israel. But it's people don't see it as usually, they see it as a challenge, as a good thing, not as a bad thing to go to the military. Because we understand the need and the logic behind it. It's not that it's a military that is sent to fight 2,000 miles away for other people's war. It's our war and our ability to... And I think that I grew up 
very clear. I was a paratrooper. I was officer in the paratroopers. I did four years of military service. My I have four children. One, the, the youngest is now going into military service, but the oldest two sons are officers. They did very long service, so they stayed beyond the compulsory time. My daughter, my third daughter, did the same, so she stayed more time. Uh, and for us, it's not a hard reality. It's a lived we grew experience. Up, right? We grew up in these circumstances where other people come from outside and say, how do you live in that? No, that's our reality. It's not that we are tougher than others. We are used to it. We, we are tough. We are tough because if you grow in these circumstances that, uh, um, that threat is imminent, it's behind any corner in general, we don't live in fear. If you, if you go to uh, there are international research about happiness of people's, the Israelis are always in the 10th ten, ten, ten mo- most happiest people in the world. Right, but it's this, you know, the never forget movement. Like, <clears throat> yeah. I understand that, you know, it. Uh, it's an experience that you live every day. The Holocaust might be something of the past, but you <clears throat> cannot because there are countries which don't, don't accept that you exist. <clears throat> yeah. So I understand where you come from, but uh, is there no closure? Is there no hope or you don't? Don't no, think I, that that's a closure. You, you know, the the issue is that for Indians, it's very hard to grasp anti-Semitism. Hmm. Uh, anti-Semitism doesn't exist in India. Never yeah. never existed. But in Europe, the Jews, not only in the Holocaust, third of the six million, third of the Jewish people of the world were uh, murdered, but the Jews uh, were persecuted over all over the years in all the countries by the Spanish Inquisition and Portuguese and in, in Russia pogroms and in every place, the Jews were persecuted. It was also a religious element. And because Jews were always different, they were like a, a closed group of people dressed differently. And they were mostly Orthodox then. And so, you know, there is something very psychologically problematic with the attitude towards Jews in the world. And I think that also towards the state of Israel as a Jewish state. So it's over criticized. It's like the standard set for Israel is a different standard than any other country in the world. But we are. We are okay with it because we are, for the first time, are independent. We are able to protect ourselves, and this is for us the the main the main element. It's uh, we understand that the alternative is worse because the history tells us that the alternative is worse. So we are also very pragmatic. We are seven million Jews today, and we were six hundred thousand in forty eight when the state was established, and we are very pragmatic about the passport and the stamping on the visa. We understand that the alternative is that people will not come because they will be afraid they will not be able to go to Muslim countries afterwards. You were brave. You were not a, maybe not a, a typical example. And uh, w- today the situation is different. And you see that Israel is one of the most successful, economically uh, most successful countries in the world, the, lead, the world leader in innovation. But also, by the way, all of that is because we were sharper than most others because we had to be sharp we couldn't become lazy or Mm. you know we have to work hard because if seven million jews with hundreds today we have peace accords with egypt with jordan uh, it's not immediate uh, the immediate um, uh, neighbors i'm speaking especially also of course uh, the others the second and we were surrounded by tens and hundreds of thousands with bigger armies and bigger abilities and and oil and energy yes. and and numbers in the UN you didn't have the resources either yeah. I've seen uh, how with meager resources you've done I mean the I went to a water salination point and uh, it was amazing and uh, now you're you're taking it a step forward I believe the salinated water is going to be put into the Sea of Galilee right? you, yeah. you could, could you explain about how this water mm-hmm. revolution because that could be a solution to India's water woes I will also take a little bit a step back you know when we started we, we have been an agriculture country manufacturing country like India. So our biggest known export was Jaffa oranges. We had Mm. the citrus that we used to export and in a certain stage we stopped exporting it not because we didn't need the money, God forbid. We always needed the money. Israel was a very poor country to start with. But we we were absorbing a lot of immigrants so money was needed. But we understood that we are um, uh, exporting our assets. Our assets are water. We don't have enough water. The difference between our country and many other countries in the world that we have a we pay a high price for the water. Water is not free and it's quite expensive. So we understand that there is value for water. Places where you don't pay for water, you don't understand the value, and you would not invest in infrastructure in order to 
make it better right. yes. so it's uh, also a cultural thing uh, i've i've noticed many people uh, in india you know farmers who think that since they own this land uh, getting water from as low as you can get you can keep digging it's yours it's, it's yours. yours so the air the water and the the soil should not be taxed should not be challenged because it's yours so we we do tax and we do challenge and that makes us more efficient because we understand that it's okay it's costly how do we save money it started with drip irrigation in the 50s when we were in agriculture so we invented the drip irrigation which saved a lot of water and also helped the plants because the plants didn't get too much water and not to to less so mm. they got the, the exact amount but then we started doing reuse of water mm. we reuse our water mm. almost 90% of our water are reused for agricultural level so we don't bring it back to drinking level because it's not economically wise we bring it up to the level of agriculture the next country after us i think is like spain 20 something under 30% so we are at 90 uh, almost 90 and the other country after us is in 30 so we reuse a lot of the water because it's a very economic way to save water and we do desalinization which is not an israeli invented technology but it was industrialized or put into big magnitude in israel and we have also next to chennai the biggest uh, desalinization uh, factory in india also mm. by an israeli company and today the idea of water is not anymore it, when we did the oslo accords in the early 90s one of the elements that we had to discuss in the final status agreement was the water issue because there is scarcity how do we divide the water today there is no scarcity so we don't have more rain but we have more desalinization more reuse of water more smart uh, agriculture are middle east countries asking for this technology from you because they are facing a crisis too yeah of course uh, we are we are first of all we are giving more water to jordan we mm. in the peace accords with jordan we committed ourselves to a certain amount okay. we are giving them more because mm. we have from desalinization we do want to retrieve water into the into the sea of galilee, galilee. to the kinneret okay. uh, we do we did even before we had relations more so now with the gulf countries that we help the salinization there are the salinization factories that were based on israeli technology the company at the time was not israeli per se but the owners okay. yeah. so we found ways of okay. how to to do business also when we didn't have full diplomatic relations and we are also doing in india by the way because uh, the only place in the world where we have a water attache is in delhi in our embassy it's based on the agreement between the two prime ministers on the bundelkhand the new p we are doing a holistic planning of a region in bundelkhand in israeli companies doing it it meaning what are the resources how we utilize them to the maximum what kind of agriculture would go with it etc etc mm-hmm. harvesting of water whatever is the play in every place you have your ups and downs what are the advantages Advantage. and disadvantages so we are doing it and we are planning there are, we are, uh, israeli in companies other parts of the israeli companies are working and again not in the work itself we do the planning and the technology that can be utilized but usually the real work is done by indian companies because there is no is- advantage Which for israeli is, companies uh, you know you, your yeah. country is it, it, it's so versatile in in startups which are there you know uh, h- how do you see the startup environment in india uh, do they do they interact with israeli companies and do you see more prospects for them uh, first of all i think that we have to commend india for a huge huge uh, step forward i think in the startup and innovation field you have uh, about 80 unicorns yeah. i believe uh, or yeah. more Uh, by now uh, very similar to our numbers by the way um, and i think the cooperation has to be much better okay uh, we part of the problem that we have is awareness in israel because we started our startup looking westwards so mm-hmm. a lot of the money coming in initially to our startups came from the us from funds in the us and our exits went to the us because the same people want you mm-hmm. to to do the the ipo the exit in the same country where they res- reside and so that was our orientation i think that the orientation of the whole economy of the world is going towards asia south asia mm-hmm. and uh, israeli ca- startups are understanding that by the way mm. it's not easy for them because they don't have resources in india you have to be more patient it takes more time Uh, it's it's a it's, it's a fact of up. life it takes more time to do it i'm now going to move yeah. a little bit Please. to the popular culture 
you know Fauda is a huge huge success mm. and it has a huge fan following in fact one of our uh, one of my colleagues is such a fan of Fauda that that's all he can talk about every time so uh, tell me when you go to uh, different parts of India do people ask you at all about whether what one hears about the security forces in Israel is true or is it overdone it's very popular here I hear it every place everywhere everyone speaks to me about it we even brought one of the actors and Uh, they complain that it's not the, the main character yeah. it's not Doron who is the main character in the film but Sachi Alevi who played now you know people uh, get Doron haircuts right I mean no no so, haircut uh, <laughs> so it's not yeah people are really touched and now I understand that there is an Indian version of uh, done I think okay. uh, around Kashmir or something there is a okay. they're coming out with the Indian version of, uh, of Fauda And what so, about the whole the mythical image about or is it <clears throat> true all that they portray I, I think that it's uh, it's true we it's have true. these kind of units I, I'm not sure that everything you see there uh, being an officer in the paratroop is the idea of sending three people in a van into a hostile area probably they will be backing okay. so they will do stuff like that but you will try to do it with ability of backing not to you You know man ma- human life for us of our soldiers since we are inscription country and everyone is connected and involved and you know it's a it's the people's military every loss of life is a huge issue in right. Israel so sending people into in such a trap it happens mm. in very in in various there was a very heroic uh, in Gaza uh, five six people that they had a shootout one died but they were able to get away but they were Arabic speaking inside mm. the hostile area area it's yeah. a very known thing of three four years ago but uh, it happens, it uh, happens yeah. yeah and you um, in fact there are many who have drawn parallels between you know the new Agnipat scheme that uh, India has uh, you know you must have heard about that yes. and uh, the parallels with the uh, with your defense forces and uh, do you see uh, you know uh, India benefiting from this Agnipat scheme and uh, do you see parallels with uh, with what is happening in you know, or what you have in Israel I, I can say that Beyond the de- defense side mm. of having conscription, in general, people going in big numbers into military mm. service, there are so many social values into it mm. that I think India can also enjoy the same values. And it starts with the fact that people feel connected to their country. Mm. It's, you know, it's a paraphrase of what uh, John, uh, John F. Kennedy said, uh, don't what ask, can you do yeah, for ask your what country. you can do for you. Once you do for your country, you feel that you're entitled also. So the connection is on a different level. But also high tech the development of high tech the ability because we are a high tech military we take all the brightest at 18 year old mm. and we put them together the brightest of minds brains we have in Israel to the, to work for the military for three years and do their work there and when they come out they <clears throat> they bond so well that they Many they of continue, them have, yeah, yeah con- many of them have started startups together, yes, I believe. This is the ecosystem of startups is very much connected, but also as an immigrant society or a very, um, you know, also for India, it's a melting pot system because everyone comes into the military, they meet each other, they meet. So it, here it would be, I mean, you're going language regi- diversity, regi- regional, you know, yeah. you're going regionally, but for Israel, it's a very small country, but very diverse. So people from Moroccan orig- origin or uh, Orthodox and Israel. And uh, non-orthodox Ashkenazi from a, a big city, they meet, meet for the first time and they speak, they become friends. They become, you know, in brotherhood of military, something amazing. Right. So it, it's a really melting pot element. People get to know their country, feel connected to the country, high mm. technology. So there are many, many, I think, advantages beyond the defense, pure defense side. So, you know, um, your Twitter handle is extremely popular and uh, you have traveled so much in India. So tell me, what are your impressions about, you know, the soft part, the soft uh, part of India is in the culture, in the traditions, uh, what you have seen? Yeah, I'm now concluding a year in India and it was a, a love and first sight because when I landed here, it was the first time, my ever first time in India or in South Asia. And I've been to Australia in the past in business, but... Uh, Uh, really the first time I came here and as I said the popular support popular love to Israel once you are uh, you know Indians and Israelis are very similar in many ways I think that uh, in the sense of to uh, the family values or family in the center of life is a very strong element in both our countries and food is always connected so every family gathering is also mm. a lot of food is is is, is connected to that and 
I think it's a love in, in first sight. We are really enjoying it, me and my family. Uh, Twitter, well, I came here with 1,500. I'm getting closer to 30,000. Okay. And it's, it's a short, it's, you know, it's, it's far from sufficient because it's, you know, it's, if I would be now in a European country, I would have 30,000. I would mm. be the king of the place. But here in India, the, the, you know, the, the market share, the size, the yeah. magnitude is so vast that I feel too small and too slow, but we are trying to do our best. We are trying to communicate. I think that today new medias are extremely important. Uh, the, the, in India, still the old media is, is relevant. Mm -hmm. In most countries, it's not relevant anymore. The written press, the, the printed press, I think India is very rare in the I sense. Think, yeah, all media yeah. is thriving. Yes, there are, uh, there is, uh, you know, kind of an onslaught of social media. But then traditional media has a niche. I think it's just our numbers. <laughs> I, I, your numbers, and maybe also culturally, you are okay. more conservative on, on the press, the way mm -hmm. people, many people see that. But, you know, there are the good sides and the bad sides of the mode. The, the good side of the fact is the fact that I don't need any more. And here it's not a problem. Everyone is happy in the press to speak to me. But in Europe, it was more complicated. And I don't need the press, the traditional press in Europe anymore in order to tell the public what I think, okay. which is a great. The bad thing <laughs> is that it's not only about me. It's everyone is the same. So we, our, our social media has become a market. You know, we are in a way, I'm uh, I, probably it's my old age. That I But people can connect to you easily, right? That's the best try, part of diplomacy. We try, yeah, we try there to are, be... You don't need an intermediary anymore. You go directly, people can write to you and say, yeah, but you know, those, hey... I um, hope not all 1.4, almost 4 billion uh, <laughs> Indians connect in one time, it will collapse. What about language? Uh, does it, uh, is it impeding when you travel in India? No, right? I, I think that the people I meet, most of them speak English. It's very rare that I, I need to be translation to be translated. But, you know, the downside, I think, of modern media is really the fact that we started, democracy started in Greece in the center, in the square, center square of city and people would come, the privileged people, by the way, would come and shout uh, uh, to decide on the decisions. They would make the decisions for everyone. And then we, have we developed into a representational, more stable democracy. Everyone votes, not only privileged. But the city corner is still there. Every four years and we are back to the city corner and we are yes. so big in the world today and coming back to the city corner, it's, it's a problem. Yes, it's noisy, but that's what India is all about, isn't it? The it's social not, media it's not is only, also noisy. It's not only about India, but it's the whole the world, world is like that. Yes. And that's how populism comes. I think of politicians... How can they take long-term uh, decisions when they will be criticized? But instantly, everyone, yes. instantly on every decision they make, a good decision. I want to make tomorrow a highway from here to there. So the greens will come. The owners of the land would come against me. The you know each one. But have you noticed there's absolutely no criticism of anything that Israel does on the social media in the Indian sphere? Yeah. Barely anything. Yeah, I, I, we are privileged. I, I must say that it's it's, it's really a, a natural privilege. Uh, thing. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I at least don't see anything at all. Whatever <laughs> steps you take, uh, it's never, you know, uh, seen from an anti-Israel point of view at uh, all. Uh, I don't think you find that kind even in Israel, no, in the social I, I think, media. I, I think that we are blessed. And I said it, I feel at home. I felt at home from the first moment. Right. We are blessed because the popular support is there, the political Support or cooperation and friendship is there. I went with Jay Shankar to Israel to visit one of the best. And I've been advisor to three prime ministers, chief of staff of the foreign minister. I've done a lot of these official visits. I think the visit of Jay Shankar was one of the best ones. The intimacy, the mm. open talk, the relations, the gestures that were done, the person, the private gestures of leader to another I think these elements are, are I like mm. which you mentioned right at the beginning of this talk about the trickle down effect that it comes from the top yes. and and then when you know that the people to people connect is also working perfectly do you see more scope for tourism between India and Israel you know India is very attractive for uh, Israelis generations of Israelis young young Israelis have this habit of going either to uh, uh, South America or to India as mochileros or backpackers here and they like to you know to have a, a year living in simple life Before of backpacker in order to relax after military service and and regain their mm. their fun and everything so okay. tourism uh, israelis come here and now there are generations of people if you go to you went to israel i don't know if you met 
people who, when they were younger or young people, have all done that. Done that, yeah, and they that know about year. they know about parts of India more than yes. probably Indians. Yes, know. and I hadn't been to those parts yes. when they were asking. So me. They, there is the the Israeli trail with the Humus Trail, as they call them. Yeah, that they go there in big numbers. I think that potential is, is huge. huge. Okay. With the, hopefully, we are going to have direct more direct flights because in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia now is allowing, hopefully, El Al. To fly and then Air India will have more flights. El Al will have more flights. There will be quite many flights. And I'm sure that many, many Indians here I meet have the desire to go to Israel. And in conclusion, uh, so you began by speaking about, you know, the trickle down effect and about how heads of state and heads of government, when they interact, uh, it sends down a message. Uh, how important uh, is is it for, uh, for our head of government and your head of government to meet and uh, send these signals on a regular basis? I think it's crucial. I, it's very unfortunate, by the way, that we have political instability in the sense that we don't have the same prime minister. We are changing all the time. It's very, very important, the relations, because things are decided there. And also the spirit of friendship that is coming and decision making from the leadership uh, uh, percolating down into the system, it's very, very important. Uh, our aim is to have, and we, we had already four times the prime minister's visit uh, postponed. In the beginning, because of the elections and the problems last time because of COVID, because the prime, former Prime Minister Bennett contracted COVID, it's very important because there is very close friendship. Mm. Prime Minister Bennett uh, met Prime Minister Modi in Glasgow. Mm. Uh, and and I believe that it's it's important because it's it's the closing, as, as I said in the beginning, closing the circle. It The people have already the sympathy, as you mentioned, also towards Israel. And now the leadership shows that it has the same interest. And when everything coincides together it's a perfect uh, match so i we we are trying to push for more and more high level visits we had our minister of defense here uh, your ministers went to israel uh, and prime minister visit we are looking presidential visit we are looking so we are working on all of that look forward to more interactions sir in the future thank you very much for speaking with us thank you thank you very much for having me thank you for watching and listening to another edition of ani podcast with smita prakash please like and subscribe in whichever platform you watched or listened to it namaste jai hind